influence our bodies or in our lives. But the truth is that abortion access will be chipped out long, long, long before this. And we know that the class of people who did this are the same class of people who demand that more people start. The same people who decide whether or not our queer students are safe in school and whether or not our students are able to return home safely at the end of the day with or without the threat of violence. The same class of people who decide whether or not we have an earth that is habitable to live on. And those same people who decide whether or not any type of justice that we want is ever implemented. We also know that all of the bans happening at the state and the federal level, and especially at the state level, such as that one to ban abortion at 15 weeks for big minors and obtain conditional bypass if they cannot afford their parents' approvals. Or the one that was just implemented to mandate a 24 hour mandatory waiting period between the time a patient is first seen and in between the time that they are able to get their abortion. All of these bans and all of these healthcare restrictions are not in the interest of our community. We know that this is going to continue to affect queer people, people of color, and working class southerners, people in all over the United States the most. That same class of people are the ones that we should be organizing against. I'm here today with the Undemocratic Socialists of America, and we plan on doing just that. If our state government and our federal government and our Supreme Court don't want to afford us our rights, then it's our job and our obligation to organize against them. I'm really happy that we are all able to get together on campus today to talk about the thing that really, really matters, and which is mobilizing hundreds of thousands of Americans. But it's time to get organized. We cannot say that we're angry today and then leave here, leaving so much potential energy to build a better world left out into the wind, because we've done that time and time again. The time to organize is now. Joining an organization such as the Democratic Socialists of America or yourself as part of the DSA chapter and the DSA chapter in your area. Joining the Gender and Sexuality Alliance and the Black Student Alliance. Joining the Latin American Student Organization, our Student Farm Worker Alliance. Joining the National Organization for Women and joining our coalition for reproductive justice that we formed as a group of students who are collectively pissed off and really, really looking forward to continue organizing. Why do you say we will see the groups throughout the rest of the summer? On Sunday, we'll be talking about reproductive labor and we'll be talking about the first place and how we should democratize it. We'll also be working on an initiative at the ballot box to codify abortion in the state law. We'll be working on voter registration. We'll be working on national and statewide days of action with thousands of students across the country. And that's what I'm also looking forward to, is organizing the thousands of mobilized students that there are in this state. Yeah, it's a winter. The, the, young, the young people are fired up, and we really need them. The last one is Grace Brannigan, who happens to be the president of the student body out of out at FGCU. My name is Grace Brannigan. I'm a student here at FGCU, and I also serve as FGCU student body president. Uh, I organized our march here on campus today, uh, mostly because I uh, have known people that have gotten abortions. I've driven my friends to go get abortions. Uh, and there are women all across this nation, there are people who can get pregnant all across this nation whose right to reproductive health care is in danger. Uh, and ultimately, it's terrifying, it's so scary to think that the government can decide what it is that I can do with my body or what my friends and my peers can do with their bodies. There's no other medical procedure that is regulated in the same way that this one is. Uh, and more than that, it's so that people can come out here today and can you know, express that and find community in that as well. Um, but abortion is important to me. I have known many, many people um, whose lives would have been completely derailed by having a child. I know people who go here to FGCU who would have had to leave school um, if they had a child. Um, and ultimately, that should not be a responsibility that we put on a teenager. That shouldn't be a responsibility that we put on young people or on any person across this nation that can get uh, pregnant. And ultimately, it should be a choice whether or not someone decides to have a family, whether or not someone decides to have children. And more so, the, these bans, bans like it across the nation, Florida's 15-week ban, uh, is an attempt to push women back into the home, is an attempt to criminalize them for making reproductive uh, health choices, and it is an attempt more than that to control all of us, to push us all back towards a idealized and religiously based past that never existed that, and that won't exist here today. Mm -hmm. the young people, wow. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you now to Corey Vega, who I've known for a long time. We've worked together 
and her son, Zach, is fabulous and was one of the leaders of the March for Our Lives movement here in Collier County. Mm -hmm. So uh, Corey is an educator here in town and she wants to talk a little bit about the issue and how it, how it relates to her personally. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Corrine Vega. I'm a high school teacher here in Naples. Um, I guess I'm here as the face of somebody who you never think it would happen to you. Um, I'm 52 years old and I have two boys. Uh, they're not boys, they're men. Uh, they're 21 and 20, but I still call them my boys. Anyways. Um, I'm from Chicago, born and raised, and in the 1990s, I was this single, independent, I am woman, hear me roar, uh, lived on my own. So I graduated from college in 1991. I moved into Chicago, two blocks away from Wrigley Field. Um, yeah, I lived on my own, and I made it. I didn't ask my parents for anything, but I come from a very upper middle class family. So I, I knew that they always had my back, but still, I didn't want to ask them because I'm like, I can do this on my own, right? Like, go girl power. Um, when I was 25 years old, my girlfriend and I went out for the evening to an exclusive nightclub in Chicago. Uh, while we were there, it was supposed to be a very short evening because one glass of wine cost $14. And that was back in 1995. And I was like, this is going to be short. I mean, we're not staying here long. Um, next thing you know, we're invited to the VIP section. Two gentlemen, I don't remember their names, introduced themselves to us. They ended up buying our drinks all night long, and we're dancing and drinking and having a great time. And next thing you know, the very last drink I received I tasted it and I just kind of went and I took like another sip and then I put my drink down and my girlfriend I was with, she drank the whole thing. Uh, next thing you know, I woke up and I was in my apartment. I have no idea how I got there. Um, it's called being roofied for those of you that don't know. Um, there is a classification of drugs that can be slipped into a woman's drink. And I woke up with a man on top of me, in my own bed. Um, I have no idea how we got to my apartment. I lived on the third floor. I don't remember walking up the stairs. I don't remember giving a key. Um, so yeah, I woke, I woke up with a guy on top of me and I remember kicking and screaming. And he got dressed and ran and he was with a friend in the front room who was also assaulting one of my best friends. Now she finished her drink, so she was knocked out cold. She never woke up. Um, I actually had to tell her about four days later what happened. I actually remember what happened. I remember chasing them out of my apartment, uh, slamming the door, putting the deadbolt on, putting the chain on. Needless to say, I was late for my period. Now here I am, 25 years old. I don't want to tell my mom and dad what happened to me. My dad would have freaked out, right? And made me move back home. So the last people I was going to depend on were my parents. And now I'm just like, oh my God, what do I do? What do I do? What? And the very first thought that popped in my head is, okay, if I am pregnant, I'm gonna have to get an abortion. I don't even know the guy's name. I literally, still to this day, I don't even know his name. How could I be expected at 25 to raise a child? And I don't even know the gentleman's name, whose child that would be. So I'm here as a face of somebody who is a survivor. I'm here as the face of somebody who had a choice. And my body ended up taking care of itself. Um, I ended up not having to go for one because my body just, you know, you know. Um, but 
it's just something that a lot of people talk about uh, the discrepancies or the, or the fact that this primarily affects the African American community, and which it does, don't get me wrong. I mean, it does primarily affect the minorities, but I'm also here to put a face to date rape and to the fact that these things happen to our girls and God, when it does happen, they need to have a choice. They should not be forced. And DeSantis, the law that he's proposing or is put into effect, excuse me, does not make an exception for rape. That's terrifying. Because I, again, I thought I had, I thought I was fine, right? Again, I'm smart. Uh, you know, I got my bachelor's degree. I got a full-time job, I'm independent. You know, you check it off the lists. I had everything and I got roofied. So um, we need to stop voting for red just because you grew up in a red family. We need to stop voting for blue just because you grew up in a blue family. We need, we need to start doing research on our candidates and find out where they stand. It's no longer what party are you affiliated with. Please do your research, especially regarding the school board. Holy cow. If you have not done your research regarding the school board candidates on this ballot, there are some true scary, scary thank you for the word, thank you. There are some truly scary people running for this school board. So, but please do your research, especially when it comes about, you know, body, bodily autonomy and having the right to choose what we do with our bodies. Judge. Judges as well, yes, you are correct. Thank you. Wow, <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you so much for attending this most important town hall. We were all shocked that something as deep-rooted in our lives as Roe versus Wade could ever disappear but disappear it has. Tomorrow is the primary election, and Corey spoke a little bit about it. It's never been more important to vote to preserve our freedoms in our country. Among other candidates, tomorrow we will be choosing our school board, like Corey said. All over the US, school board elections are becoming battlegrounds in the culture wars. Dozens of political groups are sending thousands of dollars towards school board candidates who may not have your interests at heart. School board races are more important than ever. Normally, governors don't endorse school board candidates, but this year they're doing it. If you are unhappy with the policy coming out of Tallahassee, the best way to fix that is to vote. And I know many of you have already voted early. But tomorrow is the actual election day. So if you haven't yet voted, tomorrow is your last chance. Tomorrow you won't be voting at the early voting locations. You will go to your own precinct. If you need to find where your precinct votes, go to the Supervisor of Elections website, collierbotes.gov. And I also have my computer here. I can look up where your voting day is, where your precinct is tomorrow if you need it. Thank you again so much for coming tonight. And after a few calls to action on the screen, we will open the floor for comments and Casey will come around with the mic. Thank you again so much. Oh. So you have on your chairs, on your, on your seats, you have some calls to action, just some suggested links and uh, things you can do uh, to take, take things into your own hands. So uh, we uh, really want to thank our panelists and our people who joined us remotely. And I'm going to go into the audience and see if you have any questions uh, for either the Collier Freedom members or any of our panelists. Does anybody have a question? Yes. Thank you. Hi. I, I hate to sound like a dummy, but can somebody explain what codifying this action means when, when, when the Senate or legislature or whoever says, I, we, we're going to codify this so that that would supersede 
any new law that would ban abortion, is that correct? I don't get it. So uh, you're talking about the challenge to the present lawsuit, because the lawsuit went into effect July 1. It was signed by Governor DeSantis, and it, w and it's, it is the law of Florida. But there, yeah, there was an injunction filed, and I think that injunction is still going through the works. But I believe that the, uh, does anybody else have a, yeah, Cynthia, go ahead. So um, I don't have it verbatim, but ba basically codifying the law means that um, it then becomes a numbered subsection in the uh, statutes, right? So, so it, that's when it becomes um, written and it's, uh, you can, um, Reference that law. You know, when you when people say this is the this is the title, this is the paragraph, this is the this is this uh, line number subsection. That's what you're doing when you codify it. You are actually giving it um, a, a number in the, the statutes. So it's it's written. It just strengthens it a little bit. So if you were in a court case, for example. You know, you would you would reference that law. You would re reference that statute to support your case. I wish and we had our lawyer. That house. I wish we had David Milstein. He would, he'd be able to answer that right quick. Oh, you have another lawyer. Yeah. I think I know what you're talking about. The House of Representatives has passed a law. If the Senate also passes it, it would codify Roe v. Wade. Oh, which means that they would put into law that the, the protections for reproductive freedom that are in Roe v. Wade would become the law of the land. I think that's what you were asking about. The land and the state. Pardon me? The state or the land? Well, it's a federal. So the House of Representatives, the yeah, so one of the things I was going to comment on was that at this point, we need two more senators in order to stop the Republicans from being able to um, obstruct the ability for us to pass that law, which I can't remember the name of it. What's the name of it? It's probably the Women's, the Women's Health Protection Act. So I was gonna beg everybody to please um, vote uh, for whoever the senator is, the Democratic senator is, and support other senators all over the country who can flip these Republican seats so that we can get Roe codified. It's also important to think about any of the House seats that the, the Democrats can keep so that we don't lose the House. Collier Freedom uh, is a 501c3, so we've got to be very careful. We can't be partisan, we can't promote candidates, but we can uh, speak loud and clear about policy that we don't like. So if there's policy that we feel is harmful, we, we will be loud and proud about that, but we can't we can't tell you whom to vote for. Casey, we have uh, Pallas who would like to make a comment. Pallas, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. I just have something short to add is that in codifying Roe, right, we can expand upon it because Row is a floor, not the ceiling, right? It hasn't yes. mm -hmm. it hasn't granted everyone access as, in the way that we think that it did, right? And so that's what we're finding. And so that's the importance of codifying row because it gives us something, a groundwork to build upon. Hi there, Charmaine Klein. I have a question for uh, Dr. Miller, actually. Um, so I am more concerned about the downhill ramifications of all of this, as you brought up earlier, we don't provide health care, we don't provide education, we, you know, have this uh, education to prison pipeline, you know, the two judges that now have to pay $200 million for turning kids in, foster care system, you know, where do you see this going, and what can be done to further prevent it? I think that's an excellent question, and I'm not sure if I have solid answers, but again, I think it would go back to looking to folks who could, you know, be voted into office who would support those different policies and programs that are designed to make it easier to be a parent if that's going to be the situation. Um, 
we know that looking at research that people who are forced to carry a pregnancy to term, who already might be you know, in a economically precarious situation, that ultimately it reduces their likelihood of attending college, for example, or completing their college education if they were already involved in that. Um, and so again, just thinking about ways that we could implement supports you know, for people who might be you know, young parents in higher education, um, for instance. And I think as well, I mean, there's so many people out there now who I think are you know, fighting for bringing about significant change and who you know, want to implement more policies in ways that people can potentially access care, abortion care, if they're currently in a state that doesn't provide it. Um, and so, I mean, I don't have, I feel like a lot of positives <laughs> right now. And I think, unfortunately, I mean, hopefully this will be a wake up call to, to some folks that you know, we do, do need to get out there and exercise our, our voices and our, our right to vote to implement change. So, uh, so Anissa. I want to say one other thing on that point is that I, I uh, read a book uh, in the early 2000s um, called, um, and I don't remember, it was by two psychologists, I can't remember their names, but it was uh, titled uh, Unintended Consequences. And it was a study on a lot of different social changes that they were trying to understand. And the one that stood with me the most was the fact that they looked at crime and why crime had sort of, I don't want to say disappeared, but certainly decreased over the past 20 years. And what they finally came down with was that fewer unwanted children were born. Fewer children were born that weren't cared for, that were angry, uh, that had nowhere else to go and nothing else to do but destroy society that didn't want them. So that's what I think about when I think about this, this law, uh, this, this requirement for women to have children they don't want. Um, I, well, I guess I have a comment and then I have a question. So the comment is that you're absolutely right, Barbara, or actually I think it was, uh, Maybe it was Dr. Miller. Someone said, that you don't have to vote blue, don't have to vote red, but, but research the candidates, right? And I think that's really important, but it's really hard to do that because some of these candidates are so well-funded and they have such slick advertising and you know they'll tell you anything you wanna hear until they get into office. So that's, I think, the key, is when they're in office, you still have to continue to pay attention. We have a US representative who is supposed to be representing Call your county Mario Diaz Balart, but we never see him unless there's a check attached to him, you know? And so that's the problem. We don't really have a representative. We have someone that's running against him who will be an amazing representative, but we don't have a good representative. And so here's my question, and this is not this is not related to voting. This is about this is related to how to get people to the polls. We are here because we, my guess is most of us. We understand the issue, we came to learn a little bit more, but ultimately, we're in our comfort zone here. We have to get outside of our comfort zone and speak to people who may not be inclined to vote for anybody because the policies haven't been working for them their whole lives. And so how do we go to someone and say, we, we'd like you to go through the really difficult procedure of voting because now it is, we have voter suppression laws in place. We'd like you to vote you like, we'd like you to vote for the person we want you to vote for, um, and we promise it's gonna be okay. We have to get ourselves into, I think we have to put ourselves into the shoes of the people that are being most affected by these laws. And you know, a lot of these people, they're not here because they're working their second or their third job. They're not here because uh, their parents are um, somewhere working and they're at home um, babysitting or taking care of their grandparents, right? We have a community that is not represented here. So my question is, how do we, as individuals who really, really care about this issue, how do we get ourselves out of our comfort zone and find the people that really need to speak about this? Because this is affecting their lives. And then promise them 
that they are not alone in fighting for this, that we need their votes, whatever way we ask them to vote, right, or whatever conversations we have with them, but then we are with them for the next step and the next step and the next step. And this isn't just an evening of education. This is the start of a commitment to this community. That's my question. How do we do that effectively? Thank you, Lisa. I, I just wanted to expand upon that a little bit. I'm encouraged by what happened in Kansas. People came out in droves. Um, and here's the thing. There are people, I, I know someone uh, who has never voted in their life. And I keep pinging that person and hoping that, you know, um, you know they have a, a child who's in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, she's a woman and um, stresses that she doesn't know enough to make a decision. But I say to that is by you not making a decision, you're putting it in the hands of other people who may not have your best interest in heart at heart. So I can't stress how important it is to, to um, have those communications, start talking to people. I know politics seems to be a um, touchy subject with people, but these laws affect their lives every day. And if it's not today, then tomorrow. If not them, then a friend or a family member. So um, it's really important that we, we get involved. Thank you. Um, the high school I teach at, most people don't know the side of Naples that I teach at. It's a Title I high school, uh, which it's called Golden Gate High School. I don't care if you know. Um, and 85% of my students qualify for the free or reduced lunch program. That's why it's classified as a, as a Title I school. Now, we need to get the education to these girls. I used to be a swim coach. I would teach the girls how to swim at Golden Gate High School. And one of the girls approached me and she said, my mom said I have to drop out of the school team. And I'm like, drop out of the swim team. And I'm like, oh, sweetheart, you were doing so great. Like, why? She's like, well, I got my period. And I'm like, okay. And I'm like, well, you know, I have tampons for you because we're in the water, so obviously you can. She's like, no, my parents believe that that's gonna take away my virginity. This is, this just happened. I have so, like if you are white in my school, you are the minority. I think I have, okay, I have 180 kids this year, and four, four or five of them are white. Everybody else, is Cuban, Haitian, Venezuelan, Guatemalan, Nicaraguan, right? It, it, so their education level on their own bodies needs to be first. They don't, like I said, they believe that a tampon is going to take away their virginity, right? So how do we, how are these women going to grow to be resourceful and knowledgeable voters if they believe something like that. We need, so your question was how do we reach these families? It has to start with the education. Um, and what I, last, last school year, I remember towards the end of the school year, because I teach science, so I believe in everything science, and I also believe in anatomy and physiology and everything else. So, so many quit kids, so many of my kids had so many questions about their own bodies. They had no idea how babies are made, pretty much. They had no idea about the um, ovaries and how that leads to the fallopian tubes and, you know, which leads down into the uterus. And they had, they were clueless. They don't teach that anymore. They teach the kids how to put on a condom and they, that's about it, you know, on a banana. But they don't, so we have to start with the education level. We have to, yes. Oh, look at me, just going into teacher mode. I'm like, you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christine Olivo. It is an honor to be here tonight. I am the only 
pro-choice candidate that will be on your ballot in November um, congr for Congressional District 26. Now, I, I am an educator, teach math and science. Um, I used to teach a class called Becoming a Responsible Teen, and they discontinued it because of funding, but we were teaching inner city kids on sex education, on their bodies. Um, I do firmly believe in education, but I, my question today is, is this topic, do we see that this is the one topic that can unify the community? Because I don't know what everyone's party affiliation is here. I, I can make assumptions, but what I'm saying is we're talking about reaching out. I think that if there was ever a time to actually get out of our comfort zone, I think this would be it. I feel that this is one topic that both red and blue 